We're now in Unit 8, the Byzantine Empire. We're going to be talking about the Byzantine Empire and Russia, and specifically the emergence of the Byzantine Empire. So we'll be starting about 200 AD and going through the 15th century, and talking primarily about Constantinople and specifically about Justinian, one of the greatest emperors in Constantinople. This is going to be a pretty short section of notes, pretty short little unit, because I just wanted you guys to see the more eastern side of the Roman Empire. We spent a lot of time talking about the West, and really in Western European history, we do spend most of our time talking about Western Rome. And I feel like the Byzantine Empire doesn't get enough recognition for that side of the empire. And they had some pretty major accomplishments that are pretty worthwhile looking at. So we want to talk about it, but it is going to be shorter. It will be comprised of two sections. So this is 10 1, or I'm sorry, unit. 8 1, and this is going to be specifically about the rise of the Byzantine Empire. So, there's not a focus question because of how short this unit is, but our three objectives for this section are going to be objective one, what is the basic geography of Constantinople? Constantinople is one of the most strategically placed cities in the world. Today, it's called Istanbul, and it's really, really a pretty important location on the Strait of Boris. So, we'll be looking at that. And then objective two, what great accomplishments um, did Justinian do for the Byzantine Empire? He did a whole bunch of things. So what were the most important things and how, how did they impact other cultures and other empires? And then in objective three, what splits the Eastern and the Western church? We'll be looking at the two main churches of Christianity at this time and really even today. In the West, we have, of course, Roman Catholicism. And in the East, we'll have the Eastern Orthodox Church. Very, very similar and very um, related, but some major, major differences as well. So we'll be looking at these two different faiths, and we'll even go into more detail about these two faiths in the next section. So the Byzantine Empire, or what they called the New Roman Empire. Remember, if you had talked to people from the Byzantine Empire, they would have considered themselves Romans. They would not have considered themselves Byzantine or anything else. The reason we call it the Byzantine Empire is because of its location and the people that are making up this area. The Byzantine Empire is going to be composed of Roman culture, Greek culture, and primarily Persian culture, or some other Middle Eastern cultures. And so we'll be talking about those cultures today. So you'll remember that in Rome, as it was starting to fall, the whole entire Roman Empire, that in about the 200 AD era, Constantine decided that he was going to split the empire into two to try to make sure that they could get a better control over it and make sure that it didn't fall. What ends up happening when Constantine does this is that he shifts power to the east. So instead of people seeing Rome as the main capital, even though it had been up until that point, Constantinople will now be the main center of government. Now, of course, you'll remember that this changes back over to Rome but then it again, when Rome falls in 476 AD, it'll again go back to Constantinople. So if you're living in Constantinople and you're watching the Western Empire fall to the different Germanic tribes like the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, you can imagine that you would have seen yourself as part of the Roman Empire on the Eastern side. That's going to be really important because again, in the Eastern side, they're not going to have the same problems, at least initially, that Western Rome does with these different Germanic tribes and different people trying to invade them. So here's our Roman Empire, this map here in red. And remember, it gets split right about here down the middle, just giving this side the west, its headquarters in Rome, and this side east, its headquarters in Constantinople. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the strait that Constantinople will be linking to the Black Sea with the Mediterranean. And we'll be talking about them specifically. Remember here in the West that the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Lombards, Saxons, and the Angles will come into Rome and will try to defeat the Roman Empire and will eventually succeed in 476 AD. So this picture again just kind of gives you a better idea of kind of the different Germanic tribes and what modern day countries are established from them. So here, this map is kind of important because it shows the emergence of the Byzantine Empire and its growth and then its decline, okay? So you can see that there's the city under Constantine and the later rulers, and then we have ancient Byzantine, and then the Byzantine Empire at about 1000 AD versus the Byzantine Empire at about 560 AD. And you can see that they, they slowly start to lose control over their empire at a much slower pace. Western Rome, we can say 
476 because it literally fell in one year. East, it's not nearly that clear. In the east, it won't fall clear until the 15th century. And so it slowly loses its power to many different people, the Turks, some of the Europeans in the west, all sorts of different groups of people. So Constantine, you'll remember, rebuilt the city of Byzantium, and he then named it Constantinople. He was a pretty humble guy, named it after himself. And that's going to be the city that even today a lot of people think of or refer to as the area now there. This caused the Eastern Roman Empire to gain power and have some kind of prestige over the Roman Empire. Constantinople, um, or Istanbul, today it's called Istanbul, is really strategically located. And if you look here at this picture, this is a really good picture of the city itself. One, it's surrounded by walls all the way around it. The nice thing about it is that it is also surrounded by water in three different locations. So it's a peninsula. And like I said, the Bosporus Strait is on the eastern side of it. And then you have the Golden Horn, which is on the northeastern side. And then you have the Propontis, or the Sea of Marmara, on the south southern side of it, or the southeastern side of it. So these three areas are super um, defendable because you have this nice area of water surrounding it, which makes it so that you can see people trying to come in, and they have to come only by water, which is significantly diff more difficult to take over a city if you're trying to come through water. So the only area that really is open to a full frontal attack is in the western side or the, the northwestern side of the city. And it is fortified by some major, major walls. We have the wall of Theodosius. It has these major gates. And I can't remember what how thick the walls are, but I wanted to say they were 14 feet thick. And then you have the wall of Constantine, which is an inner wall as well. So not only do you have to break through one wall, but then you have to break into a second wall. And the city would have been here in this area. And this is how fortified the city is. And so it's always been a spot that people have wanted to take over, that people have wanted, because it is so strategically located. And this probably accounts for why Constantinople is not going to be taken over until the 15th century. So here is kind of an image, uh, a sunset of the Golden Horn or from the Golden Horn viewpoint. So you can be looking, you're, you're on this side somewhere and you're looking across into the city. It actually probably is more over here since you can see the church there. And that's the sunset. And there's the famous, famous church, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. So if you were here in the city, you could totally see people trying to come across in this water and you could prepare and defend yourself. Also, it would be really hard for them to bring over supplies and men and other, everything else they'd need to do in order to take the city. So the city of Constantinople, like I said, is on a peninsula. It overlooks the Bos Bosporus, a strait which connects the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Its central location is a key tra trade route as well. And this is why a lot of people wanted it as well. It links China over to the rest of the Middle East and into Europe. And so this city is very strategically located because it brought in tons and tons of commercial trading from China for a very long time. So it's a very central location for the rest of China to the rest of Europe. So Byzantium power is going to grow in Constantinople in this this way because it's going to have this harbor. A lot of it is going to be because of its commercial trading. It's going to economically do significantly better than a lot of other cities because of the trading routes. Not only is it fortified militarily by the water, it also is a great way to bring in commercial goods that people need as well. At its height, the Byzantine Empire is going to cover up most of what the old Roman Empire had. It's going to lose a significant amount when Rome falls, but it's going to cover North Africa. It's going to cover over into uh, Europe. It's going to cover into Asia Minor and into the Middle East. So you can see that it covers a, a significant area of land. Byzantine culture is a blending of a lot of different cultures, like I said at the beginning. Primarily, it's going to be mixture of Greek, Roman, and Persian um, cultures mixed together. Eventually, the Byzantine Empire is going to start to decline, and it's going to get smaller and smaller until it really pretty much is just the city of Constantinople itself. But this city will last for over a thousand years, and it will at times grow a little bit bigger and shrink a little bit. It 
it kind of flexes at different times. Again, like I said, it's going to have these different cultures. And one of the main cultures that it'll have as well is Christian Christianity. It'll be a huge component. Even to this day, the Eastern Orthodox is a very large church in Eastern Europe and in Russia, the areas of Constantinople. So let's talk a little bit about the most probably prestigious or greatest emperor ever in Constantinople. His name is Justinian. He ruled from about 527 to 565 AD, so not a crazy long amount of time. But what he's going to really want to do is, like what most emperors want to do, revive their ancient city. And so he's going to try to recover a lot of the lands that had been lost to the different invaders, and he's going to try to continue to grow the Byzantine Empire. He again sees himself as a Roman. He is the Roman emperor, and he wants to make Rome what it used to be, the greatest empire in the world. One of his biggest achievements is going to be creating the Hagia Sophia, which is a church. And when he creates this church, it's to be dedicated to God and to demonstrate the power of Constantinople. Today, it is still architecturally one of the biggest treasures in the world. And it has tr uh, tons of different cultures and their architectural beliefs and styles in it. Some that are from his time period and others that were added later. So here is Justinian's empire at its peak, at about 565 AD. This is right when he's about to die and finish off. And you can see that he's covered all of North Africa again, and he's even covered some of Spain, which is a pretty big deal. And then he's going to cover back over into Italy and Rome and in Constantinople and into Asia Minor. So this is huge. He's covered up a huge, in fact, he's even gotten back the old Roman city. He won't be able to maintain it the Byzantines will not be able to hold on to this area very long. So if you look at the church here, Hagia Sophia, you can see a lot of different cultural architectural styles. You can see Greek, you can see Persian, and you can see Middle Eastern styles all together. Hagia Sophia means literally holy wisdom. So it's the church of holy wisdom. If you look here, it's laid out much like a Roman, If like if you look at St. Peter's or any of the other Vatican city you know, buildings, it's laid out just like a Roman building is. It's got a beginning and entrance. As you go deeper and deeper into it, you get to the more treasured or the more holy spots of the area. It has a dome, which was very Roman and Greek as well. And if you look at a lot of the columns, you can see a lot of Greek culture as well. The minarets here on the, the sides of it are not an original thing. The church was a Christian church, had some beautiful murals of Jesus Christ, actually still does have murals of Christ and the Virgin Mary. Eventually, this will be conquered in the 15th century by Muslims, and they will convert it into a mosque, and that is what it is today, is a mosque. These minarets will be added later. Minarets are the buildings or the, the towers that the Muslims call the other Muslims to come and pray from, and so these would not have been original. But you can see in the church itself some middle eastern persian style specifically if you look specifically at the windows you can see a lot of persian architecture you can also see persian architecture with some of the the ceilings inside the rooms and so we'll look at a little bit more deeper detail of this in a little bit so here's a, a nice picture of the church of holy wisdom this is this right here would have been the original church what you're seeing right here this stuff here and some of these little buildings onto the sides would have been added later but this is the original church today again it is a mosque this is the dome inside you can see that inside they've converted the very top with some beautiful calligraphy this is arabic um, writing um, I don't know what it says, but it has different, I'm sure, things to help Muslims remember what they're praying for. But if you look closely onto the sides here, the Muslims have left a lot of really beautiful, um, really beautiful Byzantine architecture and Christianity, uh, Christianity. Christianity. There's a lot of different symbols representing the different gospels, representing different. Um, beliefs in Christianity, and so those have been left. Um, and a lot of the other architecture in the building has been left as well. Anything that you see as calligraphy in Arabic is definitely Muslim today, but a lot of the other stuff is original. So here's another picture. This is instead of looking up at the dome, this is more looking straight. 
you can see how large this building is. It's absolutely beautiful. It has so much natural light that's coming into it. And again, here are those symbols that we were talking about. All original. These, again, calligraphy, this would not be original. This, these columns right here would be original. The floor, everything else is pretty original. So Justinian's um, empire is going to shrink like I talked about. The Ostrogoths will eventually come in and take over um, Italy and Rome, and his empire will shrink um, from over in North Africa to really maintaining mostly just Egypt and North Africa. Now Justinian does a lot of different things that really make him kind of a famous emperor. Number one, he has a code of laws. In his code of laws, we've talked about codifying or codifying laws, which is to put laws in order so that way people know what the laws are, what their rights are. Justinian's probably best remembered for this, his re reformation of the legal system in Byzantium. He's going to set up a commission to collect and revise and organize these laws from the Roman um, Empire. You'll remember that the Romans had the 12 tables, which outlined their rights and their laws, and that's what Justinian's going to do. He's going to take those 12 tables and he's going to redo them. They won't, there won't be 12 tables anymore, but he'll have done basically the same thing. He'll organize the laws to where people will know the difference between civil laws, laws that are in between people and how they interact with each other, and criminal law, people who break certain ordinances in the community that are punishable. The result is, is Justinian's laws are going to be called Corpus Juris Civilis, which is Latin for the body of civil law. This body of laws, of Justinian's laws, are, are going to be known that way and going to be published throughout the empire. Both the Roman Catholic Church and the medieval monarchs, they patterned their own laws after Justinian. So to show you how big and how important Justinian is, you can see a lot of the medieval monarchs that we had been talking about patterning their ways of laws and feudalism in Justinian's laws as well as the Catholic Church itself and how it it makes its laws, if you want to call them that, it makes those laws clear to its congregations, its members throughout the empire using the same system that Justinian has created. So Justinian was known for these ancient laws, the Justinian codes, and again, a lot of even our international laws today come from Justinian law. A lot of what we see in the American Constitution and the Magna Carta from England all the way into some of the international laws and the Code of Geneva and all sorts of other things in the international community can stem from this idea of Justinian's laws that he had created way before in the 6th century AD. Here's a example of Justinian's code. This is um, some of the laws and some of the codes that would have been there and it even talks about some of the things that it it led to in the future if you want to read that so here's a nice um, icon of justinian this is total byzantium style they loved to make mosaics and you can see all the little pieces of tile that they've put together to make this really nice looking portrait of him and this is really important because it demonstrates an artistic style of byzantium when you really study this stuff, you can see this kind of architecture or this art, and you can totally tell that it is um, from this area because of their style. Now, Justinian ruled with absolute power. In fact, he's what we call an autocrat. An autocrat is one person who rules with supreme power. You can think of the word dictator like autocrat. Auto means one. Crat means the leader. So he's in one leader. So he's the complete ruler over this area. And one thing he's going to do is he's going to also put himself not only in power of the government, but also in power of the church. He'll actually be viewed almost as, um, almost as like a deity, like a god. People, he's not just a normal guy. He is somebody that is not God himself, but is higher than normal people. And so people will respect him. And some people even kind of go to the point of almost worshiping Justinian. Again, Justinian combines both the political and the spiritual authority. So he's not just an autocrat. You could call him a, a, a theocrat, a, a theocracy. He's ruling the government and the religion, and they're combined together. This would have made a lot more sense back then. Today in America, we really don't, we can't comprehend that because we separate religion and government so much. Byzantium Christianity is going to be at first connected to Roman Catholicism, and they'll be completely interconnected. 
but there will be a series of things that will start to separate. And obviously the cultures will have their own interpretations of Christianity together as well. So there's some major differences in the East and the West. The Byzantine emperor was not the, the priest, although he was the head of the church and he was the head of the government, he didn't usually always bother himself with church affairs. So what he would do is he would call a patriarch. The patriarch was literally the highest official in the church. And today the Eastern Orthodox church has patriarchs at its head. And there is the the benevolent or the patriarch, the leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church to this day. You can kind of think of him as the Pope, like in the Catholic Church, or you could think of him as the prophet in the LDS Church. He is a major leader who is seen as the connection between God and his people to speak for God to all the world. And so the patriarch is a very high position in the Eastern Orthodox Church. We'll talk more about him in another section. The Byzantine Christians rejected the Pope's claim to having authority over all Christians. They will recognize the Pope as a bishop. They will even go so far as believing that the Pope is a major leader of Christianity. But remember, when the Pope crowns Charlemagne and puts Charlemagne in charge of all of Rome and literally names him the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, the, the Byzantine Empire is going to reject that right out. Why? Because they see Justinian as the emperor and they see the patriarch as one of the leaders. They don't at this time necessarily see him as above the pope, but definitely somebody that should have been consulted in this major decision. And so they'll be very offended with the pope's actions when he makes Charlemagne the king of the Holy Roman Empire. There are going to be some major schisms. A schism just means a split. And so there'll be many, many, many schisms in between the churches. But perhaps the biggest one is one that we talk about, the schism of uh, 1054. And it's going to be over this viewpoint of icons and authority of the church. Let's talk about the icons first here. Icons are the holy images that are depicted in art. So you can see here, these are icons right here. Here's Christ, and I don't know if this is Mary or if this is Joseph or who this is, but these are icons of different people. Here we have another icon, right? We have our Pope, we have um, a bishop here, and there, he's giving a blessing, right? These are icons. Many of the Byzantine Christians prayed to these images. They prayed to the Virgin Mary, they prayed to the different saints, just like you would see in the Roman Catholic Church. But then the emperor is going to outlaw that wor that that worshiping of those icons. Now, I think it's important to, to, to be fair. If you were to ask a Roman Catholic or even an Eastern Orthodox member of the church, they would never tell you that they worship the Virgin Mary or that they worship one of these icons. They would say that they pray to these icons in order to gain favor with God. So if you think of it this way. If you have a friend and you might be, you know, there's this other kid that you want to become friends with or you want to get a favor from, you might not go right up to that kid and ask him something. You might go through his friends to try to see if you can gain favor with him. Same thing here. If you know the Virgin Mary, if you pray to the Virgin Mary, if you show her dedicated worship, she might be more likely to give you, give you, a more recommendation to God. And that's really kind of how the Roman Catholic Church looks at this. They would not say that they worship those icons. Um, they would say that would be blasphemous if they worship those. So I think that's an important distinction to be fair to them. But that's not always going to be so clear. And the emperor is going to really see that this is a problem and he will not like this. He'll feel like worshiping these icons is wrong. But a lot of this is also from the skeptical viewpoint of a historian, why would the why would the emperor care? Why would he care so much about making sure that his people and his empires don't worship an icon? And again, we can look at the surface and we can say, okay, the surface is that he's worried that they are worshiping idols. And I'm not saying that that's not true, but we a lot of times want to dig a little deeper and see what maybe underlying causes were there. And so if we look at this, the emperor also might be trying to flex his muscles over the Roman Catholic Church or the Western Empire. He might be trying to say, hey, I'm in charge and I'm going to make this a rule for everyone. And I really think that's a huge part of it. And so because he bans this, there's gonna be a major battle. 
And then this is going to really permanently make a split between the Byzantine Church, or the Eastern Orthodox Church, we should call it, and the Roman Catholic Church. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be artistic or art made of these different people. Again, the Byzant Byzantium culture has tremendous um, art and artifacts created in Christianity. Here is one of Jesus Christ, again in a mosaic. He is using his hand here in a blessing manner. He's, he's bestowing a blessing of some kind. Over here we have the Virgin Mary with her child, the Christ child as he's grabbing his mother. And so again, these are all different icons that the, the Byzantums would have created and were very well known for. Here's another one. This one's really interesting. It has a depiction of Christ not looking nearly as masculine and strong and um, good looking as traditional yeah. cultures as we've seen. And then on the right here, we have a much more classic picture of Christ, again, giving a blessing of some kind. So in 1054, there's going to be this permanent split, a permanent schism between the Orthodox Christian Church and the Roman Catholic Church in the West. And a lot of this is going to come down to a lot of the councils and a, a term, a, some of the beliefs that they have. And a, most of it rests in who has authority. Does the Pope have the authority of the whole church or does the patriarch have the authority? They'll meet several times. They'll have arguments, heated arguments at times, trying to decide what is who's in charge and who's not in charge. And this is going to cause a lot of frustration and bad feelings. But they, they fight about a lot of different things, not just this. To give you an example, they they fight even over the words of... Um, of like baptism or even a christening or any of those things like that. You might be familiar with the words in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Well, the Roman Catholics will use that, but the Byzantium uh, Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, will not. And I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called colloquially. colloquially I can't remember the word exactly. But the phrasing and of the Holy Ghost, there is major disputes between the Eastern Orthodox Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And this is just one thing that they fight over. But this main schism is going to be mostly centered on who has control over church affairs, the Pope or the Patriarch. By this time, the church is going to finally split and the Byzantium culture and empire is going to decline in a huge, huge manner. In less than 300 years, 400 years, the Byzantium Constantinople will fall to the Turks and the Normans. They will advance on the Constantinople and the Turks will ultimately gain it and will create the city that you and I know today called Istanbul. And so we can get into that later when we get into Unit um, 9, but the Turks will come into the Byzantine Empire, will very quickly actually take over this area right here. This would be modern-day Turkey. Here's modern-day Syria. They come in and they actually take it over fairly easily. And then they'll eventually... The, Muhammad II is going to have a tremendous desire to take over Constantinople. I think part of it's pride. Just Constantinople is always seen as a city that was non-conquerable. And so he always wanted to take it over because that would be a signal of how strong his, his army was. And so they'll enter in here and eventually they will be successful, but it will take them quite a long time. Okay, so the Turkish Empire, or what we, we really should be calling the Sassanid Empire, which is the Persian Empire here, is like I said, going to grow and it's going to go more Western into the Byzantine Empire. Okay. Constantinople will fall in 1453 to these Ottoman forces. The Ottomans are kind of a, a, a descendant, not kind of, they are a descendant group of the Sassanid Empire. And so they will surround the city and they will eventually be able to go through the Golden Horn and through the walls and be able to take over Constantinople. They actually starve the city out. They surround it. They don't let anybody in or out. They, they let the people basically consume the food that they have. And then they pretty much start starving the city out. Again, that, that ruler, Muhammad II, was the one that entered the city. And he's going to go in and he's going to rename the city Istanbul, which is today the capital of Turkey. So here again, if we look here, this is Constantinople or Istanbul today. There's Borosporos, 
which is the strait that links the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. This area right here would be called the Golden Horde. This area over here would be the other water route that surrounds that southern side. Southern side. What was really important about the Byzantine culture is its preservation of Greek and Roman culture. We can see so much of Greek and Roman culture from the Byzantine Empire that it makes it really worthwhile looking at this empire. We also start seeing how the Byzantine Empire really, really influenced the Russian country, Russia, the country that we, we know today as Russia. If you even look at Russia today, what's the, the most dominant church in Russia today? The Eastern Orthodox Church. And it's because while we all descended from Rome and the Roman what Catholic Church, the eastern side of Europe is not going to. It's going to be influenced mostly by the Byzantine culture. So the Byzantines gave, um, to finish us off here, uh, modern day Russian, the modern day Russian language. So if we look at that, let's 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 take the two languages side by side and kind of identify some of the similarities between the two. Today we call this Cyrillic, the Cyrillic alphabet. And if you look here today, this is the similarities between the two. And you should hopefully be able to see how much the Byzantine language influenced both the Russian language um, into its modern day Cyrillic alphabet. And so it definitely was a, is a remnant of that culture. And that's a pretty, pretty profound because of how large Russia is today and, and its language is, is a major language that we study today too. And you can see that these come from this, from this empire, the Byzantine Empire. So that is the end of our notes there. Let's go back to our objectives and make sure that we've answered those clearly and that we understand what those are. Okay, so our first objective, what was the basic geography of Constantinople? Pretty simple. We talked about that pretty pretty clearly, I hope at least. If you remember, the we had the Golden Horn. We had Bosporus, which is the strait there. And we have uh, Propontis, which is the southern um, side there as well. Okay? So that's the geography of Constantinople. And if we look at objective two, what great accomplishments did Justinian do for the Byzantine Empire? That's all the different things that he accomplished. The Justinian Code, it could be the church he built, it could be any of those different things. So anything that Justinian did that we had in red, I want you guys to write that down for objective two. And then what splits the Eastern and Western Church? Primarily two things. Number one, the worship of icons, and number two, the... Um, the authority in 1054 crisis between the Pope and the patriarchs. So that's the end of our notes there. I hope that makes sense to all of you. And uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. Thanks.